While they're getting settled, I invite all of you to grab a Bible out of your pews. And if you're in the front row, they're down underneath. And open up to page 44 in the New Testament, which is pretty close towards the end of the whole book. Page 44, and you're looking for the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. So today we're going to be digging deep into a story about a woman who anoints Jesus. And I bet a lot of you have a vague memory of this story. It's actually in all four of our Gospels, but in three of the Gospels, it's a very different story with different details, different people, different things that happen. And so in order for us to really go into Mark's version of the story, I want to just highlight some of the details that you may be holding from hearing this story in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of John that are different. So in the Gospel of Luke, this anointing story takes place in the home of Simon the Pharisee. And in the Gospel of John, it takes place in the home of Lazarus in Bethany. In Luke's version of the story, the main character is a woman, and she's called a sinful woman. So she has a bad reputation in her community. In the Gospel of John, on the other hand, the main character is a woman named Mary of Bethany, and it's Lazarus's sister. And there's no indication that she was in any way more sinful than anyone else or had any kind of bad reputation. In the Gospel of Luke, the host of this meal, Simon the Pharisee, complains to Jesus after the woman anoints him about how is it that Jesus could allow the sinful woman to even touch him. And Jesus goes on to forgive the woman and to tell her that because of her faith, she has been forgiven. In both Luke and John, the woman, whether it be the sinful woman or Mary of Bethany, anoints Jesus' feet with oil and then wipes his feet with her hair. So those are all details that do not take place in Mark's version of the story. So I want you to just take all those details that I just mentioned, bracket them and set them aside, and we're just going to take Mark's version of the story on its own terms. So I invite you to follow along with me as I read from Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. And we'll stop right there. So what I'd like to do next is go back through this story again, just a couple of verses at a time, drawing out some of the details that help us understand why this story is so important in the gospel as narrated by Mark. So if we look at the context for this story, it was two days before the Passover and the festival of the unleavened bread, and Jesus is looking in towards the last week of his life. So Jesus knows he is about to die. 
people, the authorities, the chief priests are looking for a way to arrest him and to kill him. And if we think about what kind of tension, what kind of feeling Jesus might have had going into this meal at Simon the leper's house, we can imagine that perhaps he was feeling a whole mix of different things. Stress, sadness, grief, uncertainty, tension. He knew that he was going to be facing a very painful and difficult week. And he brought all of that into this meal at Simon the leper's house. And the story ends with Judas putting into motion the betrayal of Jesus. And so on both sides of this story of the anointing, we have all of this tension and grief and sadness and sorrow. So we look into this story And it says, when he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar, and she put the ointment on his head. So first of all, this scene takes place in a village called Bethany, which some of the earliest Christian commentators suggest to be translated meaning house of the poor or house of affliction. Because this village of Bethany was nearby Jerusalem, and so constantly there were streams of poor people and sick people and pilgrims who were traveling on their way to Bethlehem, or Jerusalem, sorry, and stopped often in Bethany. And so the people of Bethany often, it's likely, were flooded with all of these people in their village that needed to be taken care of that needed to be fed, that needed special help. We know the host was Simon the leper. We don't know anything else about him. The woman is unnamed, and we don't really know anything else about her except perhaps that she was a woman of some means because she bought a very expensive perfume for this special day. The most important thing as this story begins to unfold is that the woman, we are told, anoints Jesus on the head. If we think about the most common words that we associate with Jesus, Christ and Messiah, those two words translated both mean the anointed one. And it was very common that people in that time knew that kings and royalty were to be anointed on their heads. So this woman, in essence, with her act of anointing Jesus on the head, is saying, You are the Christ. You are my king. You are the Messiah. But it also says later in the story that she had done this act as a way to prepare Jesus for his death. And so her act is symbolic on two fronts. She's acknowledging that Jesus is Christ, and he is the Christ who must die. And none of Jesus' other disciples really are able to put those two things together in their minds. The story goes on. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. So the story begins with all of this tension, this grief that Jesus is in. He comes into this meal likely this woman does this beautiful act for him and you can almost in that moment see jesus kind of giving off a sigh of relief like oh finally someone gets who i am someone sees me and understands what i must do this week someone is taking care of me in my time of need but he isn't able to enjoy that feeling for very long because immediately there is this challenge by others who are there questioning why the woman would waste her money on such a beautiful and lavish act in that moment. But Jesus immediately comes to her defense and I think we can sense perhaps a little bit of irritation in Jesus for these people ruining, in a sense, that beautiful moment or taking away from it. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. And there in Jesus again, we can see him grappling, struggling in this moment 
between this beautiful act of worship that this woman has offered to him and the events that he knows are coming. He goes on to say, For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. And that one verse is probably the one, if you know any of the verses out of this story, the one that you perhaps even have memorized. People commonly bring it out in questions about poverty. But it's clear here that Jesus was not saying you shouldn't take care of the poor. He was saying every day you will have an opportunity to show kindness to your neighbor in need. And yet, in my this woman has done a beautiful thing for me. And those two things are not um, mutually exclusive. They're both good and both beautiful things. She has done what she could, Jesus said. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. And here's where we get to the most interesting verse. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And the reason that is so interesting is because Jesus doesn't say that about anybody else. He doesn't say in reference to the acts of anyone else in the Gospels that what they have done will be told in remembrance of them. So clearly, there is something very special going on with this woman and her act and the way that Jesus received it. Her deed, not her name, but her deed, will be remembered wherever the gospel is told. And I think one of the most important details in this story for us to keep in mind is the fact that this woman does not have a name. We don't really know anything at all about her. And yet, Jesus lifts her up and says what she has done is an amazing thing and will be remembered. That one detail is a clue that can help us unlock an entire layer of meaning in the Gospel of Mark. If you were to read the story, paying attention to all of the unnamed people in the Gospel of Mark versus the disciples who are named, you would see a stark difference in their faithfulness and in the way that Jesus reacts to them. So the named disciples, the ones that we can probably think of in our minds, the 12, they're, in Mark, they're kind of bumbling fools. Like they never quite get what Jesus is about. And in their moments when they start to get close, they, they end up arguing or they start jockeying for power. Jesus, who will get to sit at your right hand? And so they never quite understand who Jesus is and what he's about. But the unnamed people, like the unnamed widow who gives generously to the treasury, the unnamed little children who Jesus lifts up as an example of faithfulness, the unnamed woman who's hemorrhaging and reaches out to touch Jesus' cloak, the unnamed centurion who at Jesus' crucifixion is the only person in the entire Gospel of Mark to say that Jesus is God's son. The unnamed young man who is the only person when Jesus is arrested who doesn't flee his side. And this unnamed woman in this story who anoints Jesus on the head in this moment as he's heading into that last week of life. All of these unnamed people in the Gospel of Mark are to be for us the model of what it means to be faithful and to live a faithful life. So as readers and hearers and studiers of this Gospel of Mark, the author intended that we would look to all of these unnamed people and see ourselves in their stories so that we too might know that our faithfulness, both small and lavish, both simple and beautiful, will be remembered by God and will be important for the world. Because being a follower of Jesus isn't about becoming great. It isn't about having our name recognized. And it isn't even about being set apart in some special group. Rather, it is about loving God and loving our neighbors well, as Jesus did, and as all of these unnamed 
disciples did. So we have this beautiful, beautiful idea here that wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman did for Jesus in that last week of his life will be told in remembrance of her. Her beautiful act of love will be remembered, even if her name is not. And so may this be true with us, that whether we are on a mission trip in Mexico, or at school, or at work, or in our neighborhood, or in our families, may it be said about you that what you have done will be told in remembrance of you. Amen.